Imagine a routine afternoon when you're commuting home after long hours in the office to enjoy a nice meal in the evening with your family and maybe eventually sit down for that sitcom you long awaited for when you hear this sound break into the audio. Severe weather is a multifaceted challenge with flooding, destructive hail, damaging winds, and tornadoes. Lack of preparation or notification can increase the risk for fatalities, highlighting the importance of accurate information and good communication. Hi, I'm meteorologist Jared Maples with the National Weather Service in St. Louis. Throughout our office's history, we've invited thousands of visitors and groups through our facilities so they get the internal perspective of our forecast operations. However, that operational tempo changes quite dramatically when we're expecting severe weather or in severe weather operations. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to introduce you to a few forecasters, along with the specialized positions and the descriptions of those positions, to show you how that process plays out so that we can get the timely warnings and accurate information to key decision makers, such as media, emergency managers, or other local officials who can take their proper precaution to take you out of harm's way. As referenced earlier in the video, severe weather results in a higher operational tempo. This is due to the sheer volume of information to process along with the other operational duties surrounding the event. The first position that will be covered is the warning meteorologist and the warning assistant. As seen here, and here. To talk more about these positions is lead meteorologist Fred Glass, a well-seasoned severe weather subject matter expert. So with the National Weather Service office in St. Louis, when we're in severe convective warning operations, especially ones where we're uh, expecting significant severe weather tornadoes, we employ warning teams. This is a relatively new concept. We've been employing it for about three plus years now, where we have a primary warning forecaster and he is at an a he or she is in an AWIPS workstation and immediately adjacent to them is a secondary warning assistant forecaster. The one sitting at the AWIPS uh, workstation is the one that is responsible for drafting and drawing up the warning polygons and actually sending out the text. They're looking at information that's available on the AWIPS display. Sitting next to them, that warning assistant has a, a variety of other tools that they have at their disposal. First of all, they're looking at another radar um, analysis tool that we frequently use called GR2 Analysts. They're looking at things like mesoscale data sets. They're looking at storm spotter information, reports that are coming in. And those two are talking actively back and forth about warning decision making and what they uh, deem is relevant on the radar, integrating different pieces of information, and then trying to put out um, the best possible products. So one of the advantages also of having a warning assistant is they are um, open to communications on other people uh, that are going on in the warning operations floor. Um, the warning coordinator, people that are doing communications and so forth. When real-time information and reports are, are coming in, credible reports of maybe damage or tornadoes or video that's on the ground, that information is relayed to the primary warning forecaster and those two work together to integrate that information into the warning decisions. That another primary function of the warning assistant and the warning assistant actually wears a lot of hats. Um, he's a conduit to information that is coming in to the office from adjacent uh, weather service offices upstream and he's also a conduit for sending out information to adjacent weather service offices downstream. For example, if we have a, um, a storm coming into central Missouri out of the Pleasant Hill or Springfield warning area, they're relaying usually information onto us, which is received by the warning assistant. And then that is passed on to the primary warning forecaster. Those two, again, discuss that information and integrate it. When a warning is virtually getting ready to, uh, in probably the next 15 to 30 minutes, move out of our warning area and into adjacent ones, say uh, Lincoln, Illinois or Paducah, then we contact them and give them our latest thoughts on the storm and the type of warning decisions we've been making and what we've been basing those on. It's a common expression, if you don't like the weather, wait 15 minutes and it will change. 
The expression holds more truth in some parts of the country than others, but the Midwest is one of the regions you can say it's true. In these situations, every second counts. The NWS Decision Support Services help save crucial time that may be the difference between your safety or devastating consequences. This is especially the case during events with mass participation. Here to talk about Decision Support Services is a warning coordination meteorologist, Kevin Deitch. In the days leading up to a big severe weather outbreak, we are providing decision makers with the information that they need to keep you all safe. So we do that in forms of email packets where we tell them things like the timing of severe weather, the threats, it's gonna be high-end tornado outbreak, high-end winds, high-end hail, whatever it might be. And also the, uh, you know, the specific timing, when's it gonna start, when's it gonna end, is it gonna impact any events we have going on around our 46 counties. Um, in the bigger events, we also will hold um, well, video calls with them to give them that kind of visual information, walk them through the types of storms we are expecting. Is it going to be a line of storms where everyone gets it? Or is it going to be more of these discrete cells where not everyone will get them, but those that do will really see some intense weather. So these details are all so important to our decision makers, whether it's for big outdoor events, um, for school dismissals, really anything that involves, you know, being outside. Um, this, these, these packets and these briefings that we provide these decision makers are really important to helping keep you all safe. So when we talk about decision support, what we're doing is we're providing information to those law enforcement, emergency managers, fire, people that have those really important decisions to make when weather rolls through. Picture a big storm moving through the St. Louis area. There's a lot of events going on. There's concerts, there's music festivals, there's outdoor festivals, church gatherings, things like that. And we are in contact with those officials as these storms move through. So we provide different types of decision support services. We do what we call remote. So we're kind of here in the office and we actually will have little dots on our radar of where all the events are going on. And we will give them heads up phone calls that, hey, bad weather's headed your way. The bigger events and maybe the more vulnerable events, we actually will bring a meteorologist on site. We call that on-site decision support services. We actually will have a meteorologist sitting eye to eye, face to face with those decision makers as they have to mold their tough decision of should we back evacuate people? Should we move people? Things like that. So decision support is really kind of a major component of the National Weather Service. Whether you reside in a densely populated area or an outlying rural community, our efforts to protect life and property are unwavering. Modern capabilities and communication allow life-saving information to be broadcast at a breakneck pace. Next up is lead meteorologist Matt Beiter to talk about the communication and messaging originating from the National Weather Service in St. Louis. One of the most important roles in any National Weather Service office is taking the forecast that we spend quite a bit of time making and communicating it to our core partners and to members of the public. It's often said that a perfect forecast is useless if it's not communicated to folks in an efficient way. We do this through a large range of options from our website to social media graphics and weather stories to communicating with our core partners through an internal collaboration service or a chat room. Um, through all these dissemination methods, we ensure that our partners and members of the public have the most accurate, up-to-date, and trusted weather information they can to make informed decisions for, the, for their safety and for the safety of those around them. This role is often prioritized during hazardous weather as a dedicated position, especially when hazards are changing rapidly. Severe weather is a fantastic example of this. Sometimes we have a dedicated meteorologist whose sole duty is to take in information from the public and disseminate it back to our core partners and members of the public at large. Uh, we value this information tremendously, especially when there is a rapidly evolving situation such as a severe thunderstorm warning or a tornado warning. Uh, the information that the public and other core partners provide us can help us make more effective warning decisions and in turn protect public safety and uh, property interests across the country. The amount of internal and external information coming into and leaving the weather forecast office can be overwhelming at times. 
From analyzing weather data to issuing life-saving products, collaborating the information and appropriately communicating it takes a team. However, there is one assigned role that makes this operation as smooth as possible, all while conducting the quality control to ensure information is accurate and timely. Up next is Science and Operations Officer Ben Herzog to explain the duties of a warning coordinator. Well, simply put, the warning coordinator is the person that's in charge of severe weather operations across the office. Um, put another way, it's their job to make sure that everything in the office during severe weather operations is running smoothly. They've got to maintain a high degree of situational awareness, both in the office and in the environment, making sure all of our products, services, and warnings are going out. The warning coordinator monitors office tempo, keeps an eye on staff fatigue, changes up people's positions if it needs to happen. The warning coordinator works with the warning teams to discuss warning strategies, things like sectorization, talking about which warning teams might be issuing warnings on what areas, and decisions on uh, warning intensity tags, for instance, whether or not we should use a tornado emergency uh, on a tornado warning. The warning coordinator ensures that all positions are being filled and all tasks are being completed. Oftentimes, one of the roles that seems to get dropped is mesoanalysis, and that's a very critical uh, role in when we're uh, operating in severe weather. Um, and so a lot of times we'll see that the warning coordinator will take on that role and try to keep everybody aware of what the environment has in store uh, as the storms are moving through it. The warning coordinator also ensures that the radar is in the appropriate scanning strategy at all times. Finally, if uh, it's deemed needed, it's on the warning coordinator to figure out um, when and where we're going to send out survey teams to see what kind of damage occurred from our uh, tornado or our high-end wind events. The warning coordinator is a pretty interesting position because if all things are running smoothly, it's probably going to feel an awful lot like they're not doing very much. And that's a good thing. That's definitely what we want. They're the person that's there to kind of take over um, in case something starts going sideways, whether or not we need an extra uh, warning team out there or their phones are ringing off the hook and they maybe have to pick up that phone call. It's really on the warning coordinator to make sure everything's running smoothly and to be able to jump in when things are going off the rails. The positions you just learned about are not the only positions at the National Weather Service in St. Louis that help our operations run successfully. Considering the limited number of staff across a large number of tasks, every one of these positions plays a crucial role to our operations. Positions not mentioned such as the meteorologist in charge, the administrative support assistant, information technology officer, senior hydrologist, observation program leader, and all of our technicians play a critical role in our operations. We also want to sincerely thank all of our volunteers such as storm spotters, cooperative observers, and all partners are alike who volunteer information that can one day save a life. And last but not least, Thank you for taking out the time and showing interest to learn more about how we serve you, the public, to keep you safe and out of harm's way during adverse weather conditions. For the National Weather Service in St. Louis, I'm meteorologist Jared Lee.